Welcome everyone to a live podcast taping. Um, this is a special series that we are doing in partnership with the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi. And we are going to be in conversation about Al Rahil, the departure. And our special guests are Joanna Settle and Reem Al Minhali. Reem is Emirati performance artist and playwright. Her body of work includes two performances, Deliberately and In Cash, and Al Rahil, the departure. Reem received a BA in theater with a minor in psychology from New York University Abu Dhabi. Joanna Settle is a award-winning theater and opera director based in Abu Dhabi um, and native New Yorker. She's received commissions from Joe's Pub, Berkeley uh, Rep, the, the Kimmel Center, the Public Theater, the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi and Opera Philadelphia. She's a resident artist at Cité Internationale des Arts in uh, Paris, serves on the board of advisors for Exit 11 Performing Arts Company, Abu Dhabi, uh, UAE, serves as a committee member for the UAE Ministry of Education and Pedagogical Coordination Committee and received the NYU AD Shukran Award for Cultural uh, Appreciation in 2021. Joanna Reem, welcome to Africa. So let's get started um, by asking of the first question, which is Reem, my understanding is that you, once upon a time, were Joanna's student. So I'm curious if you can remember the first time you encountered Joanna's work or engaged with her in any way uh, whilst being a student. Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, I remember, um, I remember probably the first time I encountered Joanna's work was through class. I remember Joanna telling us about the performances she's made, particularly there is one opera that I think about a lot. And um, from what I remember, it's an opera about um, people who have Alzheimer's. And from what I remember, the class was about how, so Joanna included in the class how she directed that performance. That's probably the first time I encountered her work, yeah. Just to uh, tag on to that, uh, Reem, I'm curious, at what age did you begin to think of yourself as a playwright? Mm. Um, so I've always been writing. I remember I've been writing ever since I was like 11 or 12, but I never thought of myself as a playwright until I started studying at university and then I was thinking of majors to choose. Um, I was in between majors. I was switching majors. And one night I decided to um, just end the indecisiveness. And I decided to stay all night and choose a major by the end of it. And what happened that night is that I opened a Word document and then I wrote a play. And then I was like, okay, maybe I should major in theater. And then that's when I switched to theater and then I started taking theater classes and I started loving it. And then I started seeing the work of, I've been writing, like uh, the poetry and the short stories. I've been thinking of ways they can be directed or brought into real life. And that's when I realized that I can do playwriting as a form so of- cool. mm -hmm. I always tell people to pay attention to how you procrastinate because that's probably what you should actually be doing. <laughs> doing um so you're a perfect example uh joanna when i was reading your bio um there are these two places that keep on reoccurring there's abu dhabi and there's new york um how did you first find yourself in abu dhabi and i'm curious what surprised you about theater um what was what surprised you about your students reactions to theater in at nyu abu dhabi hi thanks uh I, uh, it's nice to be here. Hi, Reem. <laughs> um, it was about Alzheimer's, that opera. Uh, and Reem asked a million questions when that opera came up, which was really great. Um, uh, so I was sent when uh, Ruben Palendo, who founded the theater program at NYU Abu Dhabi, retired. There was an international search to replace him. Uh, and I think the job description was sent to me four or five different times from different people. Um, and at the time, I kept thinking, I'm, no, I'm not going to move to Abu Dhabi. I don't, I don't know. What, what is this? And I wasn't, I was freelance. Um, I had a number of projects going. And then uh, one of the faculty members saw me, Catherine Corey saw me at 
a, an event I had in New York. And afterwards she said, maybe you know somebody who this job would be good for. Would you please take a look at it? And I thought, oh God, I definitely should do that. Maybe I know someone who could get a great job. And then I read the job description and said, uh, and the description of the theater program and, and what the university was doing. And I thought, I'm not sending this to anybody. So, uh, uh, you know, in terms of surprise, I mean, it's a uh, uh, young artists finding each other and expressing their ideas and really questions. I mean, theater pursues questions. It's like where we workshop who we want to be. Uh, we gather groups of people together and we we take circumstances and situations which are often extreme. You know, if you're seeing a play about a, a marriage, for example, it's going to be a terrible moment in a marriage so that we can in 90 minutes somehow workshop the idea of what we want our relationships to be. And that's true of, of work like this, too, which really is performance art. We're bringing questions and dynamics into public for all of us to reflect on it. So in some ways, you know, engaging in that process with young artists is um, you can expect the unexpected and it's, it wasn't so surprising, but what's, what's beautiful about it is in a, in my classroom at NYU Abu Dhabi with 15 students, they're from 12 or 13 countries. So the reference points um for what performance is or what theater might be made of, what counts? Is it the religious ceremony in South America? Is it the wedding tradition in Palestine? Is it, you know, what are these, what's the source? I ask my students to present on theater from home and they have to decide what home is and then what their home for performance is. And then they, they share that. And, and, we kind of come to an understanding of what theater and performance might be that is shared within that studio. So that is um, the opportunity to have a conversation like that with people bringing in so many different structures and reference points and paths to knowledge and ideas and aesthetics um, and content is, uh, is really thrilling. Cool. It's interesting that idea of uh, workshopping <clears throat> and exchange and sort of collaboration. And I, when you're describing when you're describing that, are you imagining that it is an exchange and a collaboration between the sort of formal collaborators involved in theater, or do you also mean with the public and with the audience, uh, Joanna? If you can respond to that, then I want to bring in Reed as well. Yeah, I, I mean with the audience. I mean, the audience gathers, We it's a civic action. We gather our community, they're all community theaters, and we gather our community and we, we put a provocation, the artists, the collaborating team puts a provocation in the content um, in the room, but then it's for all of us to consider yeah. the question, do you know? Thanks. Um, the way the idea of using theater as a way to engage directly with the community in a in not a one way fashion, but in a collaborative fashion, for mm -hmm. me, I think surprises some people. So I'm curious if it's if you were surprised by that idea that theater could be that. I don't think I was surprised by that idea, and I don't think that as much as I believe in it, I don't think it's one of the um, main features of theater to me like I feel the way I relate to theater is different and I always see it like as a writer I believe theater um or like performance takes the script out and gives a dimension whether it was like voice or movement and then through that it brings it to life and then it creates an environment or it creates like a situation where people can see and watch I never thought um like I've never considered that a civic action I just to me it feels like a moment where everyone connects and lives something together cool so goal or a certain yeah. message to show others or to talk. cool um so this conversation is about one play in particular one performance in particular Al Rahil. so if it's okay with you let's watch a little bit of this sort of trailer that exists on youtube um for those who are listening to the podcast, you can find this on YouTube. So let's just watch a little bit of this and then we'll talk a, we'll talk about it.
cool. So that uh, that video is from the Art Center YouTube account. You can find it. And there are images and photos from the performance. Um, in many ways, uh, this is a multifaceted performance, right? There's multimedia, there's lots of stuff going on. But if you were, Reem, if you were to explain what this performance is about to maybe like your 15 year old cousin, what would you say it's about? I like that question because I actually had to explain it to my 15 years old nieces and nephews, okay, the younger nieces and nephews I have. Um, I would say to them that the performance is about um, women in different stages of life experiencing a world that's changing around them and um, um, rethinking what homes means to them, what language means to them, um, what being in between places and in between times mean, mean to, to them. I'm curious, what was the first version of that Word document like? Mm. Before you sent it to Joanna, before you sent it to anyone, um, the first sort of scribble, the, 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 you know, the text to your, the WhatsApp to yourself, what was the first version of this in your mind? It was several, I would say it started as three different Word documents. Each one of them has a scene. And then I was weaving the scenes together. And each scene, they were at the beginning, there were three scenes. One of the scenes was about childhood. The second scene was about a woman who is experiencing being a mother for the first time. And then the third scene was about an aging woman. And these were things I've written um, before. Um, and then I brought them together. And I did that because um, when I was a student at Joanna's class, I wanted to show one of, uh, I wanted to show my writing um, instead of directing one of the plays uh, we had to direct as an assignment. So I went and I talked to Joanna, I told her, can I direct my own writing? And um, she agreed. And then I went and I went through the, the texts I have and then I weaved them together. And then I noticed that most of them were in Arabic and then my classmates probably, I was thinking some of my classmates didn't speak Arabic. So I, I translated some of them um, and gave out the translation as hand, handouts in class. So yeah, that's probably the first version of the text. And then Joanna and I worked together uh, over the summer. We had several meetings and then the what used to be a five minutes, five to seven minutes short class performance developed into becoming a 15 minutes uh, performance. So cool. So Joanna, I'm curious, in your experience over the course of your, your teaching career and sort of production um, uh, and career in the arts, when you first interact with a script like that, do you know immediately, yeah, there's something here and we can expand on this. Um, it just needs sort of elbow grease. We just need to work on it, but there's something really here. Do you know immediately? I yeah, uh, well, what so Reem brought these three monologues in to directing class, and Reem's work, it wasn't just this piece, Reem's approach to performance was uh, unique. I mean, we were laughing in the tech rehearsals for this, um, this version of Al-Rahil has, uh, we added some dry ice, we added a dry ice effect. And when the designer, Marsha Ginsburg and I were in the audience looking at the stage and having this idea, I thought, let's, Reem's going to love this. And when we put the, when we put the dry ice in and this doll comes out of the dry ice and her eyes just exploded, it just reminded me, we were laughing in tech because it reminded me of different works that she'd brought into directing class, you know, not with dry ice, but so um, I, in class before those monologues, I found myself sometimes talking to Reem, not as a professor, but as a collaborator about her aesthetic, just different as an artist, you know, just two artists exchanging. I would forget that I was teaching and I would start just talking about ideas with her. So when these three monologues came in, I hadn't seen, uh, she, she brought in friends from high school outside of the class to perform it. And it was in English and Arabic. It was a mix. And, uh, I hadn't seen anything like that uh, from a, a, an Emirati artist of any age, uh, what, what she was working on. And I kept thinking about it. So after grading was 
done, uh, I I asked her if she wanted to develop it. And at that time, I thought it would be about 50 minutes and that there was an opportunity to expand on the poetry and uh, have also have an, a really formidable visual design in projections. So in this case, the kind of piece that could result from this spark um, and and what I might want to bring in terms of how many, I thought it'd be four or five performers, there'd be a large projection design, and we could weave writing like this that didn't have to be knit together as a classically structured play, but could be an, a window into exactly what Reem said the play is, which is how these, you know, these women's lives. Um, and I, but I also suggest, you know, she'd brought the material into direct in class. So if she wanted to direct it, I would just help her however I could. You know, I didn't want to grab her piece, but she seemed quite delighted for me <laughs> to direct it. And then we went and she would write and perform. And then out came what I didn't know is out came a lot of writing that she had done previously and there was new writing. And then we began a process of, how, you know, how we might want to fill 50 minutes from seven. And some of that is filled with, it's a, you know, the eight minute improvisation of the scene with them eating chips. I mean, we we didn't know. So that we did together. But I did have a sense, this is a long answer, sorry, but I did have a sense that from what I saw, that the kind of scope and scale that it could develop into, including a large uh, visual realm. Is this the first, uh, Joanna, is this the first uh, performance of this scale that has sort of been birthed from one of your classes? In, in Abu Dhabi, I mean. Oh, for sure. I mean, I don't think I've ever collaborated with a student before. So I'm curious. Um, a former you know, student. Reem is her own situation now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm curious, um, you know, what that example, the power of that example uh, for future classes and for future for future students. And maybe Reem, you can you're probably best suited to speak to this. Um, I could imagine that that 15 year old cousin um, is, you know, is going to end up in Joanna's class or in somebody else's class at NYU or other universities and say, oh, Reem did, Reem did it. I can totally do it. Do you feel like that has been the reaction? I'm not sure what what's the, people's exact reactions to it is in terms of whether they imagine the possibility. But I always tell people who write or like um, younger people who write that whenever you get an idea, just write it down, never let it go. Just keep a journal or a document where you just put everything you want to work on. Whether Even if the idea was too amb ambitious and it would take years to develop to any idea that can become a, a short poem, um, I tell people like there's value in keeping them um, and writing them and just keeping them with you because there will be a time where will you use what you have in this journal and turn it into a work. And that's what happened to me. I think this is, what, this is how a Rahil script started, the script we talked about, the first version of the text. It was writings that I kept and ideas I've had before, um, documented in a place. And then when Joanna and I talked about the collaboration, that's when these ideas came out and were turned into the script. Um, so my, my answer to the question would be um, for people who want, for people who would imagine a collaboration to just keep track of what they're interested in and what sparks their interest and then um, to see where would that fit in their artistic journey. It's interesting. Uh, Joanna, does that resonate with you? Do you feel like you have a different vantage point as well? Oh, yeah. And also, I mean, I just have to say, Reem is... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of writing. It's really quite, it was formidable and impressive what she brought forward. Um, and then what she was able to, you know, as new ideas emerged, either from me, from our collaboration, from the cast, uh, she would write to those ideas um, in, in quite beautiful ways. Uh, I will say my classes are packed with Emirati students now by comparison um, to other faculty members. And that's uh, really wonderful. I think that it's, uh, uh, and I, and I, and a number of the students, you know, I have more invitations to come into rehearsals and more invitations to, 
you know, check out some a nascent work. And it's not careerist. It's not because they're trying to collaborate. It's because I I think um, it's because I've demonstrated a commitment to uh, young artists as real artists. You know, it's not you're not an artist later. You're an artist right now. And if you're 15, you have your 15 year old voice. And if you're 20, you have your 20 year old voice and you don't get it again. That voice goes away as you move to another time. So it's a real voice. It's not a voice. There's craft that's in training, but not the voice, you know? So. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, Speaking of uh, sort of voice and language. And so you'd mentioned that there is uh, it's by, it's a bilingual performance. Um, And then you also mentioned the incredible set, the set and the sort of visual language and um, multimedia stuff which I think serves as, as a third language. Um, how did that third language sort of emerge and when did it emerge in the production process? When did you both sort of think about what's going on the screen, where these images are coming from and what that third voice is really trying to say? Maybe Joanna, if you wanna jump in on this first and then read, uh, great to hear from you too. I mean, the two people who contributed to that, Marsha Ginsburg and Fatma Al-Fadan, um, I, Fatma's Emirati. She's lived here her whole life, and the the images are her family. Um, uh, and there, it's a it's a private space on stage, uh, and it's at an, a a monumental scale. So there's something quite f- powerful about that. And that was in my that uh, the the presence, not those images, but the presence of imagery at that scale was my response, my in- instinct. Uh, to include from the first poems. But Fatma, you know, then Reem suggested a number of um, uh, NYU students who might have imagery. And I I looked through and Fatma was a lock. Marsha Ginsburg, by contrast, had just arrived in the UAE newly to her appointment. So her impression of the place, um, and she spoke about this at one of the talkbacks, her impression of the place was... um, almost tectonic. She saw these planes. She saw the sand. She saw the the blackness at night. She saw these billboards and the the plastics at the souk. And and so I think it's quite uh, wonderful to have these broad stroke palettes from from Marsha and then the the intimate uh, video and and photos from Fatma. In uh, Reem, in your mind's eye, when you were deciding to to sort of expand on the poems and turn this into a longer play, um, in your mind's eye, did you imagine that there would be this third sort of visual language that served as a as a counterpoint? I remember when Joanna and I, and I were meeting at the beginning, there was a lot of talk about including projections. I didn't know specifically which projections we will be used. Um, but... Um, I would say that the visual language was really strong and was um, had its effects when we were performing. Um, I remember we would be on stage, me and the performers, and then we will uh, perform what we like our movements. But then every time I would look at the projections, I will have a reaction to um, Fatima's images, and that will affect my performance. So I feel that. Um, Joanna and I were in conversation and then Fatma was in conversation with us, but then even we as the performers were in, in conversation with what was projected. And that's how, to me, it was like a very, um, it brings a very visceral effect and like liveliness to the performance of it. And if I can yeah. add one, yeah. if I can just add one thing, there's a lot of independence in this creative process, which is consistent. So Reem and I didn't decide what new writing was going to come in or not come in, or she would bring something to try. We would try it. There wasn't Fatma, you know, I, I looked through Fatma's images and made a selection, but she would say, I have some changes to make. And I would say, great. And I would see them on the screen, I would see the changes appear. So each of these women, you know, spoke with their own voice and the the resulting work, and Marsha too, the resulting work is the the sort of result of the collision of our voices. It's not a pre-approved situation or something like that, you know? I'm curious, what, what was the response? I mean, 
maybe even before we get to the response, um, the performance was not too long ago. Um, so Reem, I'll start with you. How do you feel? Like, how does it feel having finished the performance and now what, how, how does that feel on you? It feels, it feels great. I remember the first time we did Rahil after we finished, I was not sure about some things. Like I, I, I loved that we worked together. I enjoyed, we enjoyed the rehearsal so much, me and the performance and Joanna, and then we enjoyed talking to the audience. But then as we did it for the next, last, second time this year, um, and I edited some of the texts I have, I removed a big chunk of text that I didn't like. I replaced it with, um, writing that feels more um, true and relevant to me. And then I added a song, I added a rewrite of the song, Mama Zaman Hageya. I changed it to a song about a little girl who opens um, doors endlessly until she ages and then she gets to not nowhere. Um, the rewriting of it um, gave me so much, uh, made me love the piece even more. And now that as we finished, um, I feel that it was a good idea to do it again and to bring it back. What about you, Joanna? How does it feel? It feels good. It feels fast. Um, and I think uh, it feels fast. You know, we worked and then it opened and then it closed. It was four performances in a row. And I, I really, there's a, you know, across a long, every before every performance, we made changes. Um, the audience is the final performer in the piece. And so it's difficult to only have four days with the final performer in the piece. Um, but we made big changes uh, for all kinds of reasons. The, but the scenes were reordered. There was a lot of language on the projections that was removed. It was, uh, uh, you know, an it was amazing to come back to a work you know, make the the uh, the first production was made before the pandemic. It was it opened at the end of January 2020. So it was the last time I was in rehearsal before the entire field shut down. And it was now I'm working on many things, but this was the first time I was back in rehearsal. And in between, we had a lot of texting among all of us. <laughs> you know, so. Uh, it felt like a continued conversation. It's almost as if it's a container for, it could go on perpetually. We could go back into rehearsal for a couple more weeks. We could run it hopefully for two weeks to make more changes. And then history could unmake itself and remake itself. And then we could do it again and revise. And when we were, you know, in the next stage of all of our lives, it would be a different piece and it could become a kind of a container and an outline for this American you, Emirati collaboration, you know, it's, it's really interesting. Do you feel like the, that idea of a container is really interesting because it's almost like it's a, it's a format almost that yeah. in theory, like, like using this is a, uh, out of, out of left field, but like sort of like almost like Saturday Night Live is a format in which all these new sort of collaborators can come into. Could you imagine a situation in which there are new collaborators who are contributing to an, different versions of similar things like this in future incarnations? Totally. I, I mean, why not? Absolutely. And also there's a whole question. There's a question about dance. There's a question about music. There's a question. There's all kinds of questions, you know, um, totally. I also think it opens up space for what um, performance in the UAE might be. Uh, an Arabic language performance might be. And what, you know, like, what do you want it? To be so, I hope it's also a provocation for everyone to make work. You know, it's all kinds of work, a broad spectrum of work. Yeah, Reem, I have a question for you. <laughs> this time, this uh, latest performance, who are you most nervous or most excited about um, being able to watch it? Whose reaction were you sort of most on <laughs> on the edge of your seat for? Um, I would say, uh, so we performed for four nights and the third night we had a huge show up of, um, um, Arab audience and you can tell they're Arab from the way they're dressed. Um, 
I've been to lots of gallery openings. I've been to a few performances in the UAE. I haven't seen before two or three lines of men wearing kandoras in a theater setting. So that was very exciting to see. I was, I was, I remember when after the performance, I was just thinking, what brought them? How did they all, what made them all show up today? Um, that was very exciting to see because our show is about like women and the women, different stages of life. And then just having um, a, these lines of men looking at it and them coming to see what we show was very interesting and excited and um, exciting. And it wasn't expected, I would say. What, what idea are you hoping that they walk away with? Um, or is that, do, do you have a specific idea that you hope th the audiences sort of walk away with? Reem? Hmm, I would say just, um, I, would, I don't have a specific idea. I just wanted them to react to the performance they, the way they wanted to react to it based on their the way they think and like their histories and each person's like life and perspective. Um, if there is something I would want them to walk out with, I would say the urge to see more performances. Hmm. Cool. Um, Joanna, what about you? Um, is this, uh, did you have a specific audience that you were hoping to reach or nervous to see their reaction? Um, Going going into this this latest slate of uh, performances, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about uh, it's. Um, we had the audience that I would want every audience. So it's uh, any audience. I'd like to bring it to Ras Al Khaima. I'd like you know. I like them all the same, and I really do. I like small audiences, big audiences. I think it's nice. We sit together. We tell stories. People talk. Maybe you argue. Maybe you laugh. Whatever. I like it. You know. <laughs> So for me, um, the, I was interested to see how it would resonate. And we were having the same audience in a way, uh, the NYU audience, um, only it grew and deepened. So I was, I was interested in how we went, uh, you know, given a second chance, we went further and deeper with the work um, in terms of what, what we were reaching for. And I was interested to see if that, you know, how it resonated with the audience um, and how actively it resonated. And I, I felt this audience was, um, I think the work was a little bolder and freer and fresher and older in a way. And yeah. so, and so was the audience. Do you know, the audience was saying, I, I like this. I don't like this. I want this. I believe in this, you know, it's, so I think we something happened in that pandemic where we're just telling the truth a little bit, you know. <laughs> it's not, yeah. And and I thought that was um really resonant and interesting. Yeah, for sure. Um great. I want to do our little quick QA and then if there are any questions from the audience, we'll take some and then we will wrap up. So um let's these are four questions and maybe uh, Reem will start with you and then for each question and then Joanna. So the first question, Reem, is what are you reading or watching these days? Um, I'm not watching anything at the moment, but I'm reading two books. Um, the first one is um, A Short History in Time. And um, it's uh, about how measuring times started and how did it become the conventional way we measure time? And I'm doing that as part of the research for a short performance I'm doing in December, uh, where I create my own calendar, I name my own months, and I create my own system of measuring time. So that's one of the things I'm reading. The other thing I'm reading is a Sorrow Beyond Dreams. And it's um, a book by Peter Handeke, who is also one of my favorite playwrights, uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, Plays is Casper by Peter Handeke. And the book is about uh, the book, he, he writes this book, which is a fiction and nonfiction, where he uh, tries to track the life of his mom and tries, tries to understand why she committed suicide. And there's a lot of 
time that's captured in this book um, because he's trying to capture her life and then you see what was happening around her and her word at that specific time and how like just through the life of one person you can understand history and politics. Interesting. Joanna, what about you? I am in New York and I've been seeing a bunch of films in the Imagine Science Film Festival, which is uh, oh, yeah, founded, of course. founded by Alexi Gamby, who's an NY friend and an NYU uh, professor. So I saw an amazing movie about ice. I saw Mantia Diawara's uh, brilliant letter from Yene, which is about the fishing, the shift in fishing habits in a, a village in Senegal on the sea where he has a house. Uh, so I'm seeing a lot of science infused movies uh, and movie infused science. Um, and then I'm reading Bell Hooks, All About Love, which is pretty great. And I'm reading the catalog of Blaine de Saint Croix's exhibition at Mass Mocha. He's a monumental landscape artist. Uh, I'm in his house right now. He's a monumental landscape artist that I'm a uh, sculptor that I'm collaborating with. Uh, so I'm reading the essays in his his last catalog. Very cool. Okay, so Reem, I'll start with you. Who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? I struggle a little bit when I think about this because um, I wouldn't want to shadow a person. If there's something I would want to shadow, it would be education. Because when I think about it in Arabic, uh, it comes, like translating the question becomes, he had and then to me it becomes a place not a human so I would say I would want to shadow um, a theater in a theater festival a few days before the opening I just want to sit and see what's happening and how people are talking all the mess and the excitement I just want to be there and watch cool uh, Joanna what about you that can definitely happen Reem that's going to happen next summer. We're going to pick a festival. Uh, I like her idea of shadowing a place. I, I would like to go, um, I would like to safely and in some kind of a little bit warm way visit the Arctic a uh, uh, hundred years ago, safely in a little bit warm way and see, uh, be in that level of quiet. I'd like to hear that, yeah. hear, hear what that is. Nice. Okay, cool. I like the, I like the, the condition warmly. <laughs> a little warmly. A, a little, little warm. warm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Reem, what do people most misunderstand about your work? Um, I wouldn't say misunderstand, but there is always an assumption that the work I make is feminist or it has a fem feminist element to it. I wouldn't say my works don't have that, but I would say that it, the, femini the feminist aspect that shows in the work seeps uh, unintentionally. Like I don't sit and I say, I wanna discuss this woman issue in this performance or in this um, setting. It just happens to come because I feel the, the way we live our lives has these issues embedded in them. And whenever we make work, they come unintentionally. and. I always, I always get asked questions about, oh, why do you, do you want to discuss this feminist issue? Do you want to talk about that and that? And my answer is always no, because to me, currently, um, academic language or performance is not the way I want to speak to the people I want to speak to about some women issues. The people I want to talk to about the issues I live and the women around me live are, are like tribal people who prefer a different language or who want to understand the academic language or the performances I want to show them. And to me, what's, the way I'd want to approach them is to sit with them and create a language to discuss these issues, not to show them a performance or to come and talk to them in an academic way or in an artistic way, because those are people who might not see a value in women going to universities or in women making art. So if I come and talk to them in the language they don't believe in, it becomes even more inaccessible. I love that answer. Joanna, uh, what about you? Interestingly, it's the same, it's my version of the same answer. Um, 
there's an assumption that I'm a, a woman director, not a director, and that which of course I am. Uh, uh, but it uh, it's a very similar answer, which is really interesting. Um, it it turns out that it's if you just as a as a woman with the voice that I have when I speak clearly about what I know and what matters to me, it's an unusual sound, um, and that has to, and that is taken to be. Uh, we were asked in one of the talkbacks uh, if it was difficult to focus on if we really had to make a concerted effort to exclude men from the conversation. Uh, and it was, you know, I had a lot of fun saying really it was no trouble at all, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it, uh, and of course men aren't excluded from the conversation in the, in the performance. Um, but, uh, but it's not the center and there you know, somehow normal has been set in the masculine and uh, a redirection has been set and when we when we center uh women and so it's uh yeah it's really well it's not that it isn't of course I, I clearly uh yes of course i'm a feminist i believe in women being paid fairly and having opportunities and safety and health insurance and all of it you know uh but it's not what I'm thinking about when I make work. I'm going to make a statement on this. I'm trying to articulate what matters to me so we can all discuss it. So nice. Um, thanks for that. I'm going to skip uh, the last quick Q&A and go straight to the questions from the audience. We have a great question from Medium. Uh, Medium, I'll read it. It says, to both Reem and Joanna, would you ever consider traveling with the performance around the GCC? Um, Maybe uh, Reem will start with you and then Joanna will go to you next. Yes, definitely. It would be lovely to perform it for several audiences and to see how different audiences from different places react to it. Yes. Well, I, I, so I want to I wanna tease this out <laughs> a little bit. I appreciate the, the simplicity in the answer. But um, insofar as audiences are collaborators, um, and insofar as they are the last final participant in the piece and they help actually put a bow on it and, and change the audience. Maybe if I can expand on Medium's question, um, in what ways do you think it might actually bounce off audiences differently? Um, because, I mean, in the UAE alone, um, Ras al Khaimah is different than Abu Dhabi, right? Uh, Sharjah is different than Dubai. Um, and then, you know, Fujairah is different than Kuwait. Uh, Sharqiyya is different than uh, Qatar and Jeddah is different than Muscat and these are really different places. Um, I'm curious in what ways do you think it might bounce off audiences differently? I mean this question is about if the piece would be well received in a more conservative environment I think um, or that's one of the components of this question and I mm. think uh, uh, I think we would you know anytime that a, a presenter is considering the work um it, there's a conversation that the artists want to have with the with the presenter or the producer about why they're considering the work what the goals of the institution are what what moves them to want to bring the work um so that you you make sure it's united and i think those questions would would all happen here but in my um in my experiences with audiences and with the piece, it is uh, it's it, it audiences the the cast is very compelling, and the the perspectives in the piece are personal and they're shared with the spirit of the production is generous, um, and I I found that the work helps the 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 event encourages everyone just considering listening do you know it's not um I, I i i'd be very interested to have those conversations with presenters and to hear what was motivating them to bring the work and to to share the work very cool reem do you have anything to add i'm just wondering why do we, always, we always get asked this question. I always wonder, why do people think that in more conservative places, um, the piece might not be received well? Because to me, the, 
everything seems um, balanced. Like nothing is too outrageous and nothing is too loud and nothing is too um, quiet. Like I believe that wherever we take the piece, it can live with the audience in a positive way because the piece is about the piece is about lives and women and the stories we share are stories that wanted to be shared like our stories that we wanted to share them some other women's stories that they wanted to share so i don't see an issue arising from that it it's funny because Maryam put this follow up in the in the chat and uh and she said i'm based in bahrain i think the audience would respond differently and bahrain is generally not a more conservative and uh uh place and so i think it's it's um and I'm, I, I know both of you know this, but I think there's there are so many other different variables, right? So it's not only just a single spectrum and the level of conservatism um, isn't, it's not, as you both know, it's not so simple. Um, and so there are some, there are some environments where uh, little subcultures are more conservative about something and a lot less conservative about other things, um, that they have a long legacy of theater in some places. Um, and they don't they don't have uh, a, a legacy of like these types of performances in other places. So I think um, it is an interesting question to explore about like for Africa, I'll just uh, I'll say one last thing about Africa. Before we started hosting events online, all our, our, our events were in these like small intimate settings on like the last day of a weekend or Sunday or Saturday in the evening. And it was a very specific environment and the, and the crowd, you could feel the energy. Um, but we were uh, excluding a, a huge force, a group of people uh, uh, subconsciously, uncon uh, unintentionally. My sister once uh, told me, she's like, Mikey, by doing it at 6 p.m. on Sunday, you are telling everyone that you don't want any young parents with young children <laughs> and i was like what? what are you talking about she's like yeah that's what you're saying and by having like these cute intimate things you don't want anyone who can't sit on the floor cross-legged um and i was like oh i didn't realize that and so all of a sudden once we started hosting them online we had a completely different audience and it, and i figured bouncing off them bounced in a different way that was surprising to me and it was kind of cool so um I think it's an interesting notion to entertain. Um, but having said that, uh, Joanna, thank you so much. Reem, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, for anyone who's interested in learning more, you can go over to the Art Center's website at NYU or their YouTube account. You can see a bunch of stuff about this. This conversation will show up on YouTube and on our podcast tomorrow. And it is a real pleasure to speak to both of you. Thanks so much for such a lively conversation. Thank you. This was really nice. Thanks a lot for this. Thank you so, Thanks much. so much.